Okay, fantastic. So I'd like to thank Adelaide for hosting uh, today's conference. Um, and got a few slides to go through here, so I'm gonna get started. Obviously, uh, you know, the slide kind of picks what's been happening in the industry over the last year. It's, things have come back really, really nicely from the depths of the uh, pandemic last uh, spring and summer. So good to see the commodity prices uh, recovering. So the cost sharing statement, you can read at your leisure. Some key defined terms that uh, we put in here for some uh, that are not used to some of the terminology we use. And let's take a look at you know why we think Cruise is, is a good investment uh, in today's uh, energy world. I think that we, we really tried to focus on everything on this slide, and I, I won't get into a lot of the details. I'll just basically uh, talk a little bit about the highlights because uh, we'll talk in detail uh, in the rest of the presentation about some of these things. But obviously, the macro setup is, is very bullish uh, for net gas and oil right now. Crew is uh, very well positioned to participate in that energy transition, uh, having about 75% of our production natural gas. The uh, also when you when you look at crew is from where we were to where we are today, we were just over 21,000 barrels a day in Q4 as an average. Now in Q1, we we're 26. So you know, that represents over 20% growth. Um, and if you take a look at our, our cash flow this year, we're, we should be uh, probably increasing it by over 180%. So that, that is uh, obviously a, a function of increased production, lower costs, and more importantly, higher uh, commodity prices. Uh, if you look at our resource, it's uh, obviously large at 265,000 acres. Um, our net asset value based off of our reserve report is anywhere from $9.66 to $15.43. I think more importantly, when you look at uh, what we've done over the last three years and uh, adding value, uh, we've added uh, reserves at a cost of 15 cents an MCF as an average over the last three years. So that's, uh, that's a very cheap uh, additions for, uh, for reserves and obviously generates high recycle ratios. Market access, we, we do have access to, to, the, to uh, the three US uh, uh, and pipelines in addition to future LNG access. The optionality, we do have to sell down assets. Again, we have a $37.5 million option to sell down 11.43% uh, of our, of our uh, infrastructure, uh, meaning two gas plants. Uh, liquidity is looking good. Uh, we've got lots of liquidity, $150 million bank line and about $75 million in debt and working capital in the quarter. So uh, lots of liquidity there. Our commitment to ESG, I'll speak to uh, in, in a bit of detail at the end. And obviously we're aligned with our shareholders and bondholders uh, and the fact that uh, the top, in the top 65% uh, of, the, of the top 20 shareholders are, are insiders, meaning 13 of the top 20 are insiders. So, and we have been buying uh, a lot of stock over the last uh, year. Here's some Q1 highlights. Um, and again, it, you know, if you take a look at this, I think it's uh, really depicts uh, where we started uh, the year uh, and it, at the end of Q4 as well, where we were able to uh, essentially uh, drill a number of wells, uh, seven wells in particular in the nine to five pad that, uh, that averaged uh, you know, over 5,000 barrels a day for, for quite some time. Uh, average production in the quarter was 26,258 barrels up, up 21% over Q4. Operating costs were down, which is good to see, down 12%. Uh, our cash flow was up materially, up to $34 million. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, it's, uh, it's up from 15.6 in Q4 and steadily increased from, from last year. Again, a function of higher production, but more importantly, money prices have come back. Uh, we did spend $50 million, which is a little bit less than we expected to spend in the quarter, uh, drilling 11 wells and completing uh, six over that period of time, and you can see operating costs definitely going in the right direction uh, down. As far as participating in the energy transition, um, you know what we have uh, in, in terms of how we're uh, coping with what's going on, particularly in, in the world, and has, as the world transitions to uh, more uh, renewables and natural gas, we think that that natural gas is going to be a, a very important. Uh, piece of the puzzle going forward and the fact that it really has a, a base load for energy needs. And that, that really is critical because we, we believe that, and I think everyone else does as well, that without natural gas, uh, renewables will not be relevant in this uh, day and age. And, and as a testament to that, the IEA is forecasting uh, gas uh, production 
uh, and demand to increase over 33% by between now and the end of 2050. So that, that's a big step. And if you take a look at the renewables, it's a, roughly around the same amount. So gas and renewables are going to grow in lockstep going forward. And obviously, everyone's talking about hydrogen, but it is a very, very important part of blue hydrogen uh, going forward. That is going to be uh, an energy source. Just another slide illustrating that by OPEC, uh, natural gas, they're, uh, they're projecting 24.3% uh, increase in natural gas uh, demand between now and 2040. And then if you take a look at the us participating in energy transition, and, and you know, Rafi spoke to some of this stuff earlier, but I think short interest in Canadian energy stocks are at five-year lows right now. Uh, capital inflows and ETFs, uh, number one uh, since 2019. So uh, clearly there, there's been a more attention being paid to the, to the uh, industry in the last little while. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see more of it, and, and uh, we'd like to see more attention also paid to some of the uh, uh, smaller cap companies. Uh, as, as he also spoke about. So um, on the on, on the slide, clearly, you know, we were just talking about uh, the reserves and what they're worth uh, as far as a per share basis. Um, that that relates to the nine dollars and sixty six cents to fifteen forty three. We talked about at the end of two thousand twenty. And as far as a recycle ratio is, is concerned, we were uh, six times on a PDP reserve base in two thousand twenty, which I think was probably one of the better uh, ones in the industry. Uh, clearly, I've talked about the low F&D over the last three years at 15 cents an MCF. And, you know, we, when we take a look at the land that, that we have in the Montney, it, it is really, really well situated uh, uh, strategically in between the three pipelines close to the coastal gasoline pipeline. So, you know, we believe, and we, we took a look at this and said $1,000 an acre, but much of the land in our area has been going for $5,000 plus an acre. So if you use the $5,000, you know, you're coming with $15. If you, if you use $1,000, you're coming up uh, with that $9.66 per share. So um, lot, lots of uh, latitude to, to move around between those two numbers. Next. Okay, so on the reserve highlights, again, uh, again, just to illustrating, last year we didn't do a whole lot. We just drilled some, some because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and Q4, we put some production on, which really, they helped our F and D, obviously, um, and uh, and increased our PDP reserves from 63 million BOEs up to 67 million. Go ahead, John. In terms of the uh, the economics, what we've really seen, and this is a quite an important slide, and, and, and one that I'll talk about a little bit here. Um, if you take a look at where we had book reserves in 2014 versus 2020, we were, at that time we were drilling wells roughly a mile long. Now we're drilling them two to three miles long. And uh, the efficiencies around that are, are shown here by the capital. Capital is essentially the same drilling two mile laterals today as it was drilling one mile laterals uh, a few years ago. In addition to that, the frac technology that we're using is far more advanced and more effective. Um, and we're able to touch more of the rock when we do frac it. Because of that, you know, you're getting higher IP rates and that sort of double where we were then. Uh, you're getting more reserves and uh, obviously you're getting much more value generated on a PV basis, uh, on a per well basis. So, you know, some of the things that, that we're doing uh, that, that are different, obviously, you know, we're able to stay in zone more than where we were uh, five, six years ago by using rotary roof steerable uh, uh, technology. In addition to the fact that we are able to crack these wells more intensely using more sand at less cost just because of the efficiencies around timing of the fracks. Next. That nine to five pad we put on in December, it's about 68% paid out uh, at the moment. So just, and obviously a benefit from fairly robust gas prices in, in February, but, um, and you'll note that we did have a high uh, gas price in Q1 at over $5, with $5.54 at MCF, which I think is probably one of the highest I've seen uh, to date. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, um, and we are, it supports about 100% production growth uh, in our, in our uh, production over the next, uh, well, anywhere from uh, two to, to four or five years. We've got a 4,000, 40,000 BOEs of capacity, and we want to grow from about 22,000 in 2020 up to around 32,000 average in 2022, which constitutes about a 45% uh, uh, growth, growth rate. Next. OK, 
Okay, in terms of um, in margins, you can see here that uh, we have been steadily improving our margins. And you saw that in one of the first slides when we showed that uh, our operating costs in, um, in 2000 or in the first quarter were down 465 of BOE. Uh, we are, when we take a look at this, that includes the operating costs, which are going to come down around 25%, transportation around 30, GNA 15, and interest around 25. And I think it is important to note that we are shedding around $9 million of annual transportation uh, fees uh, this year, at the end of this year. Thanks. Take a look at the production growth. Again, um, you know, we were $41 million last year. We're suggesting based off of pricing today in production that we're forecasting 115 million this year and around 150 million next year. Um, there's the sensitivities on the right to, to gas and, and uh, cash flow. In addition, um, I think you know the, the sort of the name of the game these days is paying down debt and, uh, and generating uh, free cash flow. And, and one of the things that we are, are doing in this plan, obviously the, the plan is to take advantage of our infrastructure, the infrastructure that uh, is being unutilized so we can optimize production through that infrastructure that will drive margins higher and in the end will drive free cash flow. So what we're, we're uh, factoring right now is on strip pricing, we should have a free cash flow next year of anywhere from 55 to $75 million. You know, here's our, here's our uh, hedge book. And, and again, um, I, I think one of the things that, that, you know, I can say is that we were very fortunate in the first quarter to be exposed to some of the markets that we have been exposed to, particularly the Chicago market. Uh, what we have seen in the last uh, couple of years now, we've been in that market for about six years now. I think about four and a half of those years were pretty good. Uh, when the Nexus and Rover pipelines uh, came on uh, from the uh, Marcellus and Utica, uh, that connect into that market, uh, we saw pricing deteriorate over the, over that period of time, and you know, for the exception of that one February uh, cold weather, uh, prices have really been down quite a bit in that market. So as a result of that, we, we've kind of uh, pivoted away from from that market, and you'll see here that uh, ACO is going to be the, the the bigger market for us here in the foreseeable future. But we do have the optionality to get back in some of these markets down the road. We're about fifty five percent hedged our gas production this year at uh, uh, 308 and MCF and about 35% next year at 305 uh, and MCF. And again, this is all part of the two-year plan to, to ensure that we have the cash flow to execute that plan by doing some uh, active hedging. Let's take a look at the optionality here. Now, uh, many of you know that you know, we've, we've bought and sold many properties over the course of, of time. Um, we, we've, uh, we've raised uh, over $700 million uh, by selling properties over the, since, since 2010. And we, we do have an option to sell another uh, piece of our gas facilities at about 11 times multiple um, for uh, $37.5 million that we have not exercised to date, but that option is available to us until June uh, 30th, 2023. On the liquidity side, we do have plenty of liquidity as I discussed uh, earlier. The leverage metrics, uh, that's something that's obviously we're very, very focused on uh, in the fact that uh, we do have higher than, than our peer group uh, leverage metrics. Uh, and one of the reasons we're, we undertook this program is to get us back on, on side with that. So if you can take a look, we're at five and a half times debt to cash flow or EBITDA uh, to, to, to cash flow or net debt to EBITDA, sorry, in uh, last year, we expect to be net debt to EBITDA. Uh, anywhere between 1.7 and 2.3 now in, in Q4 22. And that, that's changed from about two to two and a half times we had in here in the last presentation based off of uh, higher commodity prices. So definitely the leverage metrics are, are getting into a place where we're happy. I think at the end of the day, we'd, we'd be happier in that one times or under. Um, okay, so in, in terms of our resource, I think we talked about that. Um, there's a, a number of the, the shale uh, plays around North America. One thing I will say about uh, the Montney in the area that we operate in, for, for most of the part in the Montney, it is not a shale. Uh, it's, it's typically a siltstone or a sandstone and more behaves like an unconventional reservoir. Um, so when, when we do see lower declines out in longer life in the wells, uh, they don't sort of go straight down in terms of declining. They, they level out at, at a certain decline rate. And right now, you know, wells we haven't drilled in septums for about four or five years, we've got an 11% decline rate there. So 
You can see here, our declines are in that 28% range, usually in the shale basins in the US are around 50%. One of the things that um, is, is unique about the Montney, it, it has really good to excellent reservoir characteristics, fracks quite easily. Um, and obviously uh, fracks, uh, if you can frack wells easier then you have lower costs doing it as well. So uh, economics are, uh, are important. And really, I mean, one of the problems with having gas in, in Canada is you have to get it to market and it costs you quite a bit to transport that gas. The good news is from a Canadian perspective is that the loyal, low royalty structures that we have um, take make up for, the, for what we have to pay in, uh, in transportation to get these, these products to market. This is a, a slide that I think most companies have this, uh, this slide now, and it's really what it is, is uh, de depicting where we have potential prospectivity um, and where we have drilled most of our wells. Um, in general, I'll just say that uh, at West Eftimus, the, the go-to zone for us has been the B zone, and we, we drilled a lot of wells in that zone. And as you go um, to the Southwest into Ground Birch, the, the A and double A zones become the more prolific zones in that area. So. Um, as we just drilled three wells in Ground Birch, and we will be completing those wells. I'm very excited about what we have seen in, in the pilot hole there. So uh, that that will be coming at some point this year. In addition to, uh, we, did, we drilled a well at Attachee to hold land there. Three wells we did drill at Ground Birch was, were to hold wells there as well. And we do believe there's significant lower monty potential um, in, the, in the the tower area where uh, there's been some offset uh, uh, activity that uh, has yielded some very good calls. Okay, this depicts uh, our reserves that we have booked. We have relatively um, a low number of sections booked on our lands here. You can see it's 19% in the upper mine and less than 1% in the lower mine. Uh, really just illustrating uh, lots more potential to, to and tower, especially uh, now that we there's a lot more activity around there, drilling wells in the lower mine and in the upper mine that uh, we, we can access. So that for now, the, the, the focus of our uh, drilling efforts has been closer to our infrastructure, which is in West Septimus. Okay, this is uh, West Septimus. You can see there's a number of wells on here. I'll just focus on a few of them. The nine to five pad is the one that we put on at the end of uh, 2020. And that pad uh, it has performed exceptionally well. It's a 68% paid out uh, right now. And we expect about a seven month payout on that, on that pad. Um, on, next is the one of eight pad that we've drilled and will be completed uh, this year. And then we have uh, also completed the 30, 332 pad where we have uh, gas condensate, higher condensate rates, just, just under 500 barrels a day, average per well for the first uh, 30 days. So happy with those condensate rates. Um, and then also the 414 pad, which is uh, a nine wall pad that we have. Uh, currently, we had drilled two wells on that pad uh, in April, and then we'll. Uh, uh, put the rig down uh, until probably late June and then start the rig back up again to finish the other seven. So lots of activity going on here. Uh, right now we have about uh, 10 ducks that we have in Q1 and then we drill two more in Q2. So about 12 ducks available to us at the moment. Next. Okay, this is ultra condensate rich area. Uh, again, just a blow up of uh, that slide that we just saw uh, below. I think really what we want to focus on here is the fact that um, just on 17 and a half sections of land, we have an MPV uh, in our reserve book of $609 million. And, and many of you know that, that that's uh, under our enterprise value today. So I think, again, a great uh, proposition here for value uh, and the exceptional wells uh, to date as well. You can see on the right, we're expecting uh, payouts in that seven month range again on, on these wells uh, when you take a look at uh, the prices that we're seeing today. Next. Septimus, uh, okay, we have not drilled wells in here in a number of years. And you can see on the on the uh, bar chart on the left, uh, there's CapEx and then cash flow. Uh, so, you know, the big big year we drilled a number of wells was, was in uh, 2014. Uh, clearly that was a while ago. And then ever since 2016, that asset has produced free cash flow to the tune of about $150 million. I think the other thing that uh, is, is indirect on this uh, slide is if you look at the gas price that we achieved uh, through that period of time uh, versus, uh, versus ACO. So you can see the ACO price in blue, and then that's the average price for the year, and then our price that we achieved in, in the pink. 
Um, clearly, after 2015, our marketing efforts were, were rewarded by going to Chicago. In 2020, that, that reversed, where Inco was a better market than Chicago was, and as I pointed out to you, um, it, it's really because of the nexus of over pipelines accessing that market and, and providing more competition. Uh, of key here, importance is once these wells um, have stabilized and, and you know, they don't have any offset uh, fracking or you are putting new wells on that have 60% declines, you're looking at 11% decline on this asset at the moment, which is more like a conventional reservoir. Next. Okay, this is other opportunities that we have. Um, we do have other land that's not on this map uh, where uh, Dave and Sadiq were talking about their lands at Oak and Flat Rock. Uh, we have about 55 sections of land up in that area. We, we haven't really done anything with that. We're actually very keen on seeing um, the results that, that they have and, and others in that area. Uh, so, so that's great. And uh, at Atachi, uh, we, we have roughly around 45 sections in what I would consider to be the liquids rich area, which were, were the name Attachee is, and then down to the south, that's, uh, that's Portage, and that is uh, less liquids prone. And then obviously Ground Birch, we're excited about the potential there, and you know very close to the coastal gas link pipeline. Uh, we've got some fairly significant wells that have been drilled around us more recently by some other operators in that sort of 10, 15 million, dollar, 15 million cubic feet range. So um, excited about the potential there as well. Market access, uh, again, there are the three pipelines, Alliance um, in blue, and, and you can see the TC system there, and then the Enbridge system in yellow. Uh, we're right in the middle of it all. And uh, coastal gas link down to the bottom, you can see there that is very close to our development uh, at, at Ground Birch. So uh, we believe that we, we could be a, an excellent source of gas for uh, uh, LNG Canada. Okay, in terms of, of uh, sustainability and, and uh, the ESG, uh, we are very focused on, on this, obviously. I mean, it is something that we, um, and the industry is, is really focused on. And obviously you all, you all know the, how Canada fits in the world. We're in the top three um, in terms of our ESG scores. In addition, that we are coming out with our inaugural ESG report uh, this summer. So we're excited about that uh, as well. Uh, next, John. Okay, uh, again, freshwater use and hydro hydraulic fracturing is way down for us. It's down 91%, uh, now only about 4% in 2019. We're just getting our 2020 numbers uh, together now. Um, and gas plant flaring, you can see, is down 71%. Uh, spills are down materially as well. Uh, we're, we're using um, a lot more uh, natural gas for running the uh, frac crews as well, so we're, we're saving. Uh, on emissions on that uh, toward going forward. And we're also looking at electric as another source. And one of the things that we, we were, I think the first in Canada to do um, was we used a, a spoolable pipeline to transport water during frac operations for uh, two pads, uh, the, the nine to five pad and the 332 pad. And if you were to take a look at the number of truckloads, we, we say it was over 7,300 7, uh, two-way truckloads that uh, didn't happen uh, because we put this pipeline in place. In addition, that would equal to about four times the circumference of the, of the globe. So in terms of truck travel, just for fracking uh, one of those wells. So very, very uh, progressive. And, um, and now we're hearing that other companies are, are trying to do the same thing. I'm, I'm proud of our team uh, who went to the uh, BC government and OGC and, and uh, pitched the concept and got their approval for this. Uh, so it, it has worked out extremely well for us. In terms of uh, safety performance, again, uh, lower than in industry average and trending in the right direction down. Uh, safety is extremely important to, to our crew. And uh, it's something that we, we, you know, we focus on a lot. And uh, you can see it, it's starting to show, and it really does show in the, in the, in the total uh, recordable incident frequency, as you can see there. Uh, next, in terms of the clean energy, as I mentioned, uh, you know we, we are in the top three as, as far as Canada is concerned. Uh, I, you know it it is uh, somewhat disappointing to see you know the U.S. come up with 11 
BCF a day of, of LNG um, production that's being transported off offshore when you know we started our our um, first LNG project before they did and uh, we still don't have any LNG off, off the coast of British Columbia but when we do the good news is it'll, it'll take the equivalent of 18 million cars um, off the road and obviously displaces higher uh, GHG emission sources of energy like coal. Next. Okay, and, and I, we did talk about uh, this earlier, but I think it is important to also uh, emphasize is that we are, as, as a crew, as a member of the crew, we are shareholders and bondholders. Um, and we, we do engage with our shareholders right, right, quite regularly. Unfortunately, um, you know, with, with the pandemic, we haven't been out as much and actually at all, we've been doing more of these types of, uh, of conferences and one-on-ones on, online. Uh, but definitely, we, we are um, uh, poised to, to get going once the, once the pandemic pandemic is over, and uh, can't wait to get on to see our shareholder base. Uh, one of the things that we have done uh, more recently, we, we added a, another uh, person to our board, uh, Gail Hannon. Now takes us to about thirty six percent female representation on our board, and we do have a, a board refresh with David uh, Smith uh, retiring this year and Gail coming on board. So. That's our average board tenure is about 10.2 years. Uh, highlights again, uh, I won't really get into them. It's basically on the same, uh, the same as we, we talked about on, uh, in the beginning of the presentation. But what I think we can offer shareholders is growth and value at a very, very reasonable price uh, since we're trading in the dollar range and have an asset value over $9 and uh, growing over 20% uh, in terms of production and, and over 100 and 50% in terms of cash flow this year. So um, we are looking forward to completing our two-year program and getting our balance sheet in, in shape so that we are in that sort of 1.7 to 2.3 times uh, debt to EBITDA and uh, look forward to executing on this program. That I'll take, uh, John, I will take questions. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. So congratulations on a quarter. It looked very strong. And it seems like your deleveraging plan is off to a very strong start. I know Rafi mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation, but just looking at the sheer opportunity in owning crew right now, I think he had it at around 500% as you guys, you know, deleverage, increase the margins in your business. And then you guys have this favorable commodity backdrop behind you. It seems to me people could do quite well in your stock these days. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> I guess, I guess my question is, you know, after this two-year plan, you know, what does crew look like on the other side of it? Yeah, so we want to get to that sort of 32, 33,000 BV mark. And as I said earlier, we have 40,000 BVs of capacity. So if we could grow at kind of 10%, 5 to 10% into that, get the balance sheet in shape. And obviously one of the things we, we have to do is refinance our bonds. So so that is something that we're focused on. And we think when, once we get our... our um, debt to cash flow or debt to EBITDA in, in the right position that uh, we'll be able to do that. And our bonds have really reacted well uh, to this plan. Uh, and the fact that uh, they're up about 45%, we were trading in the 60s, now we're at about 93 this week. So uh, definitely going in the right direction and, and getting in the, in the direction that we would be able to refinance at some point in time. Is the plan then to just refinance them um, using debt again, or would you look for a combination of debt and equity and reduce the level? Yeah, I think, well, one of the things we're sensitive to, to is dilution, obviously. I mean, if we saw a material increase in our, in our share price where, you know, we, we thought it was, it was at a level that reflected reasonable value for the company. We, we would definitely entertain that, but uh, we, are, we have no, uh, no reason to issue equity uh, this, in this market at this point in time. We're more focused on, on the debt and how we can finance that. Yeah, I also think that with the uh, positive cash flow that we're seeing in the commodity prices uh, strong over the next couple of years, there'll be an opportunity to bring down our debt. Obviously, we're focusing on or we uh, our plan shows us free cash flow for next year. So, you know, uh, there'll be an opportunity just through cash flow and and um, uh, free cash flow to to bring down the debt levels uh, over the next two years. And we'll see where where that takes us prior to uh, refinancing. And then a question I had, but an audience member actually asked it as well. So I'll make it into a bit of two parts. So you guys talked about, you know, some of your other areas um, and the optionality that you guys have. 
So would we look at kind of those other areas as non-core and assets that are potentially for sale? And then the audience question saying, you know, are you guys actively pursuing sales of any of these assets right now? Or just how are you thinking about that part of your business? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think some of our assets have been for sale for years. Um, obviously, we, have, we still have a heavier, heavier oil asset that uh, we had tried to sell a few times and we thought we had sold, but we didn't. And uh, so that is perpetually for sale. Uh, I think the, the, the other, um, the other um, asset that, that we would look at um, is, is a thing, everything north of the Peace River, really. And so that would mean Atachi um, and Oak Flat Rock. Uh, would be something that we would entertain and, and uh, potentially tower as well. I, I mean, we want to focus our efforts where our cost structure is is low and, and we can drive margins higher. Um, and, and that one, you know, even though it is oil, it, just the cost structure is not as good as it is around septum and squat septum. So that's something we would have to work on if you were to develop it. But uh, those are the three that we would definitely be interested in selling. And, you know, part of the, the other question is, are we actively looking at selling some of these things? We have some interest in some of these assets right now, so you know we'll see where that goes. I can never, never say it's going to get done, but uh, it's good to see that at least there's some interest. And then, do you guys have any ex expiries on any of the land that you guys have to deal with, or it's just all mostly held at this point? Yeah. So, so the big, you know, it, great question because you know this first quarter is where we really solved a lot of those issues for ourselves because we drilled four wells uh, that held about 60, 62 sections of land. So that was a big deal for us. Um, we drilled the three at Ground Birch and then we drilled the, the one at Detachi. So that's behind us. And uh, so we're happy about that. And you know what, what went along with that was, was drilling uh, the three wells, obviously Ground Birch, which we think could be highly productive. And then you guys have this you know, ultra condensate rich uh, region over at West Septimus. So how many locations yeah. do you guys think you're gonna get there? Yeah, so so right now in the reserve report we have about fifty locations booked, um, and uh, so that that's going to change all the time because what we're doing is we're we're drilling these wells. Initially we're at one mile laterals, and now we're two, and now we're going even like two and a half to three. So, mm -hmm. so the numbers are not necessarily as indicative as um, you know the amount of production we think we can get out of that area because the number of wells are going to be reduced with the lengths that we're drilling these wells at. But right now there's about fifty in, in the reserve report. And then as we keep going to the east, we're starting to get into tower. So if we start developing our infrastructure to, as we go east into tower, that's going to make it a lot more economic because the cost structure is going to come down. And in tower, there are probably about another 40 locations in that range. I saw with the quarter that you guys had drilled some of the longest wells, um, two of the longest wells that you guys ever had in your company history. So should we be expecting some more news around them next quarter once they're completed or? Well, they just blend yeah. in with everything else. <laughs> yeah. so, so what we typically do is give averages. So uh, right. <laughs> we'll talk too much about the individual wells, but we'll give like the seven mile average kind of thing because what we're doing is we're drilling in two different zones that we're drilling in in the A and the B. And they're both different in terms of what the prospectivity and productivity will be out of those zones we sort of combine it all. Um, and But we are, the, this 414 pad is quite exciting for us that we're currently drilling. Uh, we, we've set some some uh, pace setters on. We drilled uh, one of the wells. It was about uh, I think fifty five hundred meters in uh, seven days. So uh, very very quick, and um, and we're very happy with you know the technology that they're using, and and more importantly that we're finding. I think the whole industry finds in the in the U.S. they do the same, but um, that you really need to stay in the zone that you're targeting, and and uh, because the things just go better. You drill faster, you frack the wells easier. There's there's a lot of a lot of uh, positives. Okay, well, those are all my questions. So if any more come in, I'll email them to you guys offline. But, you know, thanks so much for coming on and, and for chatting to our network. Uh, we haven't really talked to many of the oil and gas companies over the past year. Everyone's been pretty quiet, but it looks like, you know, it's definitely more of an upbeat market going forward. And so it is nice to get updates. And, and we think there is a lot of opportunity in the sector and especially in some of the small cap names because people just aren't watching them as closely anymore, which is always interesting, you know, from our point of view to try and, you know, get stories out to the market. Well, thanks for getting in front of it. I think this is a great idea. So uh, hopefully we get, get uh, some interest out of this, but I, 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 I we agree with you that uh, it's been a while and the interest seems to be coming back. <laughs>